So, um, before we start on solving problems using iterative method, let's have a review of uh, three methods for solving the Poisson's equation, right? So we have finite difference, finite volume, and finite element, all of which can use iterative methods. So let's have a review of all these methods to see what kind of structure do we get out of these problems? I think it will also be nice to kind of uh, uh, have a review of what's the different uh, what's the different requirements or disadvantage advantages the the kind of work you have to do for these methods. So the Poisson's equation. Let's first the thinking one D the second derivative of the solution plus a known function is equal to zero. Okay, and let's uh, still take the simplest form at x equal to 0 and 1. So basically we have Dirichlet boundary conditions. So this is just uh, for you if you don't remember. So in finite difference, so for finite difference, we have a solution. We store the values of the solution at these grid points, right? And then, for finite difference, we approximate the second order derivative using ui plus 1 minus 2 of ui plus ui minus 1 divided by delta x squared. And it works the best if you have a uniform mesh. If you have non-uniform mesh, you probably need to derive a different finite difference operator for different every grid point. Like of course, you can do some symbolic calculation, but it'll quickly become very tedious when you go to uh, two dimensions, three dimensions, and then you have different number of neighbors for every grid point. Then it becomes a big mess. Okay, and then you plug it in into this equation. So what you get is a is a sparse system. You have u1, etc., to un plus a vector f is equal to zero, and the matrix basically corresponds to these terms, right? The matrix corresponds to minus two over delta x square, one over delta x square, etc. But the key thing we want to show here is that we have a sparse system. Every row of the matrix only have at most three non-zero value, non -zero values because there are only three terms involving the unknowns. So the number of non-zero terms in a matrix is equal to how many unknown variables is involved in each equation. That's true for finite difference, finite volume, finite element, and everything, right? Okay, so that's finite difference. We get a sparse system. We have a sparse matrix to solve. If we go to 2D and 3D, how many unknowns do we have per row? What's 2D? We have five, right? For this equation, we have five. And uh, uh, because the stencil, this is usually how I draw it, right, is involves five elements. For some equations, you may involve, or some different discretization scheme, you may involve also the corners. You have a stencil of five. In 3D, for each row of the matrix, you have either seven or or 27 if you have three by three by three. And another option is you only include, uh, um, you, you exclude the eight corner points, right? So you have 27 minus eight is 19. So, so there are all these different possibilities. But then there is a small number of non-zero entries in the matrix. Small number compared to the total number of unknowns. And uh, uh, the percentage, which is the number of non-zeros com compared to the total number of entries in the row, is a good way of quantifying what's the sparsity of the matrix. If you have a sparsity of 1%, that means about 1% of the the rows are non-zero. And the sparsity would, would increase or decrease if you have a bigger system. 
decrease, right? The, the value would, uh, it becomes more sparse or the percentage becomes smaller if you have a bigger and bigger system. Because the number of non-zeros in each row is fixed, right? As you increase your problem, the sparsity goes inverse proportional to the problem size. So, so that is one of the first uh, reasons why solving big problems require iterative methods. Because iterative methods can really take advantage of the sparsity. While direct methods, in a lot of cases, cannot. So you spend the same amount of work if you have a very sparse system or if you have a fully dense system, like the ones you get in boundary element methods. All right, so that's for finite difference.